Sisters and brothers, when we started planning for today's conference a few months ago, there was no Occupy movement. Think about it. The Occupy movement has only been in existence for five weeks, and yet it is the new preeminent political movement in the country, overshadowing the Tea Party, blanking out the despicable Republican debates, exposing the bankruptcy of President Obama's pro-war and pro-capitalist plans. We in the Party for Socialism and Liberation and the Anti-Coalition have been energetically participating um, and supporting the movement in many, many ways, and many cities in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Albuquerque, and here in the Bay Area, just to name a few. So what does that tell us? Number one, it's impossible to predict the emergence of a new mass movement, of mass rebellion against the system, against the status quo. The artist Michael Franti said, revolution never comes with a warning. Number two, you can never predict the emergence of a mass movement if you can't emphasize it enough. And today, we see why that is that it came about. That tens of millions of people have lost their jobs since 2008. Homes, healthcare, pension benefits are all in danger. Millions have been driven to destitution. And the majority of people in the country for several years now have wanted to end to these deadly US wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. The war in Afghanistan alone cost $330 million a day. Deportations by the record numbers under Obama, and two and a half million people in US prisons. The immense danger involved in global warming. But in the US, this movement is not just because people are poor and suffering. There's other countries where people are much, much poorer. I think the fact that it's made the action take place, the things to really light up, is that people see the huge gap between the rich and the poor. That after all the billion dollar bailouts and everything that's been handed over to the rich, that they're so immensely wealthy, you turn on the TV and all you see is ads for luxury automobiles and the things that nobody can even dream of. The gap has grown huge. And the media's attempt to put a negative light on the Occupy movement just isn't catching on. I saw a picture yesterday on the internet that had a man with a sign that says the 53% don't support the Occupy movement. It's like, oh, yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> now, and now they have to admit, after this brutal police attack, that it's inspired more support because the people are in support. And the majority of the people of the U.S. for several now, years now have been opposed to what I've just mentioned. But the opinion polls are only a gauge. By themselves, they change nothing. And what brings about change is the mass movements. But for the mass movement to emerge and take hold, it must be struggle and action. The incredible response from the labor unions, the political community groups, and above all, the thousands of people who have never been involved in the protests shows that Occupy Wall Street has hit a nerve and is a catalyst. We may see this the beginning of a whole new era that the ruling class will not be able to hold back. Now that it's sprung to life, it faces many issues and some contradictions and problems. First and foremost is the government and police repression, especially the police which regard any mass movement that demands justice as their enemy. The ruling class may have nice words, they were, they were actually interviewing some corporate heads who said, this is really great, but it's got to end at some point. <laughs> they, they, they have to give it some kind of nice sounding support, but what they really want is to dismantle and destroy it. They're in a dilemma. Tuesday was an extremely brutal attack on the Oakland movement and the camp. Our members and supporters were there. And the next night, this past Wednesday, it was only the determined demonstration of resistance of over a thousand people that kept the SFPD and other city police departments from launching a massive attack on Occupy SF. After they were forced to back off that night because we heard you know, that they were at Treasure Island, and they were at Treasure Island, until 3, 4 in the morning, people were there waiting for the attack. But later, the SFPD claimed that those hundreds of cops with their weapons and buses and handcuffs we're just having a 3 a.m. training exercise. <laughs> yeah, right. And we were just having a midnight picnic at the... <laughs> yes, 
incubator costs launched a big attack on occupying Nashville, Tennessee, and San Diego, making many arrests as they've done in other cities. But the repression is only bringing more support. And how many of you saw the thousands of people in Egypt yesterday rallying in defense of the Occupy movement? have been hoping for some action in the U.S. They know that the key is a struggle for a revolutionary movement in the United States. And that's the role of our party. Up until now, the movement has raised slogans like Bank banks get bailed out, we got sold out, and we are the 99%. They haven't raised specific demands, but it's also characterized itself as a leaderless movement. Many, many people with widely divergent views are part of it, with views including anarchists, libertarians, democrats, socialists, and many who don't define themselves as any of the above. But it's not accurate to say it's a leaderless movement. There is no leaderless movement. There can be a spontaneous beginning as has taken place, but leadership quickly emerges in one form or another. And when the leadership isn't defined, it's also not accountable, but it's still leadership. There's actually, by, by that being so, it's actually a less democratic form of leadership than one that's elected based on political perspective and dedication to the struggle. For a movement to be effective, it will take a very strong organization over time and the development of a leadership to accomplish what needs to be done. And the struggle that we're in is against a very powerful, organized, and militarized ruling class, the minuscule minority who have the whole repressive state apparatus. And another issue facing the Occupy movement is that repressive apparatus and the role of the police. There have been people who've been appealing to them as they've been smashing people down, saying, you're part of our family. We're fighting for you, too. You're the ones affected also. But it's not true because we see the police as part of the 1%. Not because of their wealth, because they have a salary, but they're a fundamental reason why the 1% is in power. They are the reason why the 1% stays in power. That's their essential job description, to defend private property, along with the courts and all the rest of the press's state apparatus, to protect the owners of private property. They say that the camps have to be destroyed because of public safety and public health. But why don't they go around arresting slumlords who maintain yeah. unsafe rackets? doorways here in the mission and open up empty buildings. They have a power. When the 1989 San Francisco earthquake hit, many of us were here at the time. And the police immediately that night, while thousands of people were in the street and didn't know what to do, the police drove immediately to the banks. We saw them and shone their lights all night to protect the wealth inside those banks. While the youth in Oakland, for example, scrambled up the damaged freeway that had collapsed to rescue people. And that is why our party has been very busy the last few days to put out a special edition of Liberation Newspaper. It's a stunning piece of literature, a 20-page paper that we will print by the thousands. It will be here any day now with important and inspiring articles like, Are the Police Part of the 1%? Because the confusion needs to be clarified so that the movement can be more focused on who the real enemy is. And it's clear that what we're facing in the U.S. and worldwide is a crisis of massive proportion. And the trend will be for the super rich and their rulers who serve them, from the president on down, to continue that attack on the working class. They plan to gut Social Security. They plan to gut Medicare. They plan not to improve on health care. 
but to add more people, more foreclosures, more homeless, more unemployed, more students in debt, more prisoners to the roles of the poor. And it will not change until we're big enough to make a change, and change on a permanent basis. As somebody else said, you know, we can fight for reforms, but they can get rolled back years later. Now, in the coming elections, both parties will try to co-opt and take advantage of the struggle. Um, today, they said that all the candidates for mayor are for the Occupy movement. <laughs> but there's a progressive, a formerly progressive mayor in Oakland who helped smash the Occupy movement because, you know, they have to keep them um, in power. So the electoral system of the capitalists, whether it's two parties in the U.S., or even someday if they allow a third party to have access. The system is made to keep the capitalists in power and the masses subdued. And the power of the capitalists will only be dislodged by a movement that hopefully, sooner than later, will become that revolutionary movement of millions to say a home is a right, not real estate, that a job is a right, that school must be free and universal. And don't let the myths that we're taught against socialism fool you. Look around you, and you'll see why socialism is not only necessary, it's entirely feasible and absolutely critical for humanity's survival. Everything you use, everything you see around you, is produced now by the hands of thousands and thousands of people. Your clothing is first cotton maybe picked in a field somewhere, or some fabric produced in a factory. It's shipped somewhere for um, sewing and putting together for shipping to stores, for being sold, everything we use, the food, everything is produced by tens of thousands of people. And yet, in all this production and life that is social in the world, it takes a cooperation of millions. But the problem is, it's owned and controlled by a tiny, tiny minority whose right to private ownership of the means of production, this dictatorship decides whether to lay off tens of thousands gets to decide whether to mow down entire forests, whether to produce massive bombs and use them. And look at the hotels that Powell mentioned. And he described all the jobs that, they, uh, that the union represents. I won't go over them, you've heard about it. Do you think that the owners of the Hyatt are needed every day to tell those workers how to fix a, hospital bed, uh, a hotel bed? Or how to serve the food or make the food or lay it out? The owners are not needed in any way, shape, or form. The ownership is what's creating the crisis. It's not population, it's not the distribution, it's the ownership. Under socialism, all the means of production used to create wealth is owned in common and owned by no individual. Instead, the people decide how to use that wealth, how to build schools instead of bombs, to grow food for eating, and not for biofuels, to conserve on the Earth's resources and not exploit oil for profit, to respect all people's rights to their land, resources, and self-determination, and not to create racist myths about other people in order to destroy them in the war. Get involved with our party. You will find we're just like you. You know, sometimes a new person walks in and wonders, what are they like? <laughs> I did. I wonder what kind of lives they led. But we're workers just like you. Poor, trying to pay the rent or that mortgage. Trying to make sure that we keep our jobs. <coughs> trying to figure out how to find justice in this world. We're a disciplined collective of members whose life dedication is fighting for a new system based on meeting people's needs. We're an organization that's involved in every struggle that arises. And when there's injustice, we help to create that resistance. The idea that this can actually happen in the U.S. seems impossible to many people. But who would have predicted the Occupy movement? And nobody in any country where the revolution has taken place ever thought that they would see an overturning of that system. Except for the revolutionaries who fought for that change. Even if they thought it wouldn't happen in their lifetime. And as the Cuban revolutionary leader Fidel Castro once said, Every ruling class thinks itself invincible until history teaches it otherwise. For long periods of time, 
Huge sections of the working class can also think their own ruling class is invincible, that everything should be left up to the politicians. And the rulers of every empire, going back to the time of the pharaohs and the Roman empires, thought they would reign forever. They were all brought down, and the U.S. empire will be as well. The masses of the people are the real makers of history. There may be long periods of quiet, but when the masses move, there's no more powerful force on earth.